You know, it's one thing when you're healthy and you don't have a massive migraine and you can come out here on these shows and be fine. I'm going to tell you, I do have a pretty bad migraine today. So we're going to try to push through it. This is episode 10 of Around Your SEC. A lot of spring games went down yesterday. We will talk about them. No specific order, just in the in, in the order that I, we viewed them in. We'll talk about Alabama. We'll talk about Georgia. We'll talk about Florida. We'll talk about Arkansas, Tennessee, LSU. So we got a lot to get to. So a lot of things to break down. I'm not going to stay completely long on all of them, but just give you probably two or three things that I liked from each team, two or three things that I thought that stood out negatively for each team. Actually, besides one, I think that there was one team that showed you this weekend all around that they're very good, and that being the Georgia Bulldogs. We'll touch on them as well. We'll talk about Arkansas, what I saw. A lot of hype coming out around Fayetteville, and I, I got to be real with you. I don't know why because, uh, yeah, you looked okay, but I don't think you looked great. So when you compare like Arkansas to to LSU, Georgia, uh, shit, even Tennessee, they did not look the part. Can Sam Pittman fix some things? in Arkansas. We'll talk about that uh, here today as well. So good to be back. Episode 10 of Around Your SEC. We're all for a little while. We just had so much going on during the spring, mainly due to the fact because uh, we were going to a lot of LSU practices, obviously covering them uh, on a day in, day out basis. So had to push it back. Thought about doing Tuesdays and Thursdays, but it just didn't really go that way so good to be back good to be here with you i appreciate all of you joining us do us a favor by hitting the like and share if you're on facebook hit that share share to all those sec groups share to all those all of your pages uh, as well if you're watching this listening to us on youtube like subscribe notification bell wherever you are listening to podcast rate review and subscribe jude said glad these are back yes we are glad that we are doing around your SEC. Got to admit, though, Jude, I uh, blistering migraine. I don't know necessarily what it's from. Actually, I have a decent idea of what it's from, but I am not at my best today. So what we're going to have to do here is you're just going to have to bear with me. If I miss, say something, and you're like, Blake's just crazy, uh, maybe it's because I have a migraine. But Maybe it dials me in enough not to be screaming and yelling all over the place. So might be a good thing. Harlan Harris, our good buddy, says, boo. Well, I don't know, Harlan, if you can really boo when your team is trying to come into the SEC. It's not my fault Jordan Travis got hurt. Time to move on, man. I feel like Florida State, <laughs> I'm going to be quiet. No, I'm not. I feel like Florida State, for what it's worth, like the girl broke up with you, bro. It let, Like, let's go. You got to, we're a couple of months away from being back to college football, which I think that they're going to be really good. I think that they're going to be really good. So, uh, but you're not in the SEC right now, so we're not going to talk about you. We're gonna we're gonna stay uh, inside the SEC. I think LSU fans might get a little mad at me today um, because I do have to actually talk something glowing about the University of Alabama. I don't think outside of their field yesterday, which was horrendous, I don't think that they they had a bad day as much as their fans, as much as Auburn fans were trying to tell them. Uh, and, and quite honestly, I don't know what those fans are looking at. Like I, I saw on social media yesterday, um, Alabama fans were on Jalen Milrow, and I'm like, he went. They were like, he went three for seven, and I'm like, he completed three passes in the opening drive. He went three for four in the opening drive. By the way, you scored. Oh, by the way, he came back out there. He threw. He connected for two more passes. So he's five for. Se- uh, he's five for six. You scored another touchdown. Like, what are you talking about? It's defensively that I would worry if I'm the University of Alabama. So 
Got a lot to talk about. I don't know if LSU fans are going to be happy with me having to talk about Jalen Milrow, but I'll tell you what I saw and why he might be the biggest uh, winner in this offseason. Uh, Chili says he's at work, but tuned in. Good to have you in here, Chili. Billy Wade says, who do you think the Saints going to get? I really don't know. I really don't know, and this is a college football SC show, but if I had to, if I had to pick, if Brock Bowers is there at 14, I'd take him, but I think they're going to go with a tackle. They desperately need a tackle. And I got to be a little honest with you. I, I I don't I don't agree with probably two-thirds of the takes that are out there from Saints Media. Oh, we need this, we need that. If you're if Michael Penix is in the 40s, take Michael Penix. Bro, tell me that you have not watched college football without telling me you have not watched college football. If you're gonna draft a quarterback, and especially in the first two rounds with the needs that you have if you're the Saints, look, I, I Washington fans hate me. I don't hate Michael Penix. I just don't think that his what you call stylistically is going to fit him. I don't think it's a good fit. I think he needs to go somewhere else. I mean, to be real with you, I mean, are there a couple teams in the league that I think that he fits? Yes. I just don't think that the New Orleans Saints uh, is one of them. So, uh, it is what it is. It is what it is. All right. Let's get rolling. Everybody do us a favor. Like we said earlier, hit the like and share. Share to all those groups. If you're on Facebook, share to all of your pages. You're watching us, listening to us on YouTube. Like, subscribe, notification bell, wherever you're listening to podcasts. Do us a favor by rating, reviewing, and subscribing. So about our good friends over at BetOnline.ag or good friends over at J&J Exterminate. Don't go anywhere. During the break, hit that like and share. We're back next. Let's talk some SEC spring games and what we observe. We do that next. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way for you to wager on all of your favorite sports, contests, events, with the first-to-market odds in lines. Find reviews for all the news for each league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, college sports, esports, and even golf. BetOnline continues to be the top online resource for all of your sports information for live in-game betting, props, and futures. Head on over to BetOnline today and use your mobile device to join and make your first sports bet. Use our promo code BELIEVE50, that's BELIEVE50, B-L-E-A-V-5-0, to receive your 50% off welcome bonus on your first deposit. That's BetOnline.ag, BetOnline.ag. Louisiana is unique. The food, the festivals, even the bugs. No, not mud bugs. Unwanted bugs like these. The ones you don't want crawling in your home or business. Trust the shield from J&J Exterminating. We've been protecting Louisiana homes for over 50 years, earning the trust of our clients because we deliver what we promise. Protect your home from pests. Get the shield from J&J Exterminating. J&J Exterminating. Yeah. We're back! Not a fantastic thing to hear in your ear when you have a blistering migraine. But, nevertheless, we are back. Good to be back with you on our Around Your SEC. Listen, I'm going to try to get to all of your comments at the end of the show, but we got so much that we have to talk about here because multiple teams had spring, spring games yesterday, wrapping up their spring. And a lot of them around the SEC. We're going to talk about a lot of them. Now, I will tell you, when it comes LSU's turn, I will probably and more than likely just keep it simple because we've talked so much LSU on this channel. If you want to see my thoughts after the spring game, just go over to another video. Go to the post game, the spring post game. You'll get a lot of my thoughts because not a lot changed after that by the way, I, I I hate to say this, but some people sometimes just don't. Oh, you know, I, I'm gonna keep it alone. I understand what some head coaches, and I listen to every head coach that had a spring game this weekend in their press conferences, what they saw, what they liked, what they didn't. Every one of them lied. Every single one of them lied because everything that I saw on the film from all of these teams. Every coach lied in their press game, or post game press conference. Every single one of them. Well, I, I thought this was good. I thought this was bad. No, you didn't. You're just trying to talk to your team through the media, and I think that's what a lot of coaches do. And I think it's it's what we saw a lot yesterday or, or two days ago. 
Let's start off at the University of Alabama. So obviously you know and everybody knows that there is a new regime in Tuscaloosa. Actually, Nick Saban was at the spring game uh, on Saturday under the new regime of Kalen DeBoer. The first thing that pops out to me for Alabama, and I, I saw this on social media, and I went back this morning and rewatched. Maybe I, at least I thought maybe I had missed something. I think the talk has got to be how much more crisp Jalen Milrow looked than he did a year ago. The first thing that you thought would think from Kalen DeBoer, who is an offensive guy, and quite honestly, guys, an offensive genius, you would think that the quarterback room would take a next the next step. Guys, go watch Jalen Milrow from a year ago and go watch him in the spring. Now, I know what you're going to say, and we're going to talk about this on all of these spring games. Blake, it's spring. What are you realistically pulling out of? Well, I think Jalen Milrow's footwork is 10 times better than it was a year ago. I thought the touch that he had on his passes was 10 times better than it was a year ago. I thought his decision-making was 10 times better. Now, is he going to be an elite passer? No. But he's much more improved from this time last year to where he is right now. Now, remember last year where Jalen Milrow was. I remind you that it was Saban and Tommy Reese who went out and got Tyler Bugner, who plays lacrosse now, because they didn't know if Jalen Milrow would wind up being the guy. I think you could say the same thing for Ty Simpson. But for me, and some of the throws, I don't care and don't believe until you have to go back and watch, oh, these were the stats of Alabama football. Well, I saw three of seven from some people on Jalen Milrow. Maybe they couldn't count because he completed three passes in that opening drive. If he is serviceable enough, and not just throwing the ball deep, but if Jalen Milrow is serviceable enough at the intermediate passing game, offensively, they take a next step. Now, they got some really good wide receivers. They had some really good uh, debuts in the spring game on Saturday. And I think that under Kalen DeBoer, you will always see a team that's got playmakers. And we saw it on Saturday. But what Jalen Milrow did shows you offensively that they can take a next step and they're going to be better. And you would expect them to be better under a head coach like Kalen DeBoer. The thing for me, though, was, and I think that the, the biggest stamp outside of Jalen Milrow was because he was able to throw stuff at a consistent rate, a consistent enough rate in the intermediate passing game, it opened up lanes for Jam Miller. It opened up lanes for, for Hayes and everybody else. And quite honestly, that offensive line, who realistically last year had moments where they were not that great, well, somebody forgot to tell them that and that you can get better in the offseason because they 1,000% did. They ran the ball all over the place. And I think it does say something about Kalen DeBoer in two things. Look, we have a lot of questions about him. Can he recruit at a high enough level at Alabama to sustain in the SEC? Well, they're recruiting well. But he took a running, he took a, a, a running style of quarterback, which is what people will say. I don't know completely that he is. But... He takes a quarterback like Jalen Milrow into what will be more of an air raid type of system. Because they he, he completely changed things. You didn't see on Saturday what, uh, what you saw last year at Washington. It's completely different things of what they've done. I think Kendrick Law from Shreveport is a guy that everybody needs to keep their eyes on. Offensively, guys, I really think that they're going to be pretty decent. I, I th Because if they run the ball like that, and Jalen Milrow can hit those intermediate passes. Guys, I'm not going to say that they're going to be the best team in the SEC offensively. I don't think remotely close that they'll be able to do that. What I do know is, is that they're going to run the football and run it right down your throat, and I do question if they can stop it. Jam Miller had a big day. Jalen Milrow had a big day. The offense, is specifically at the offensive line, looked just so much better. I, I mean, you can, you can tell – that last year's Washington team for DeBoer, that offensive line is much better than what he had a year ago and maybe cleans up some things on what you want to see DeBoer do because he can run the football so effectively. Here's the bad. And when the portal opens tomorrow or later tonight, whenever it is, there are a lot of teams in college football, and this is going to be a recurring theme, and it's not 
something that you would say is just Alabama, like Alabama centric. Now, I will remi- I will remind you that when Kalen DeBoer got there, he necessarily couldn't go and was behind the eight ball at getting guys in the portal. I think that they're going to be big players in the portal when it opens tomorrow. But they really need interior defensive linemen. Because if that offensive line isn't as good as some people say that they're not, well, then how do you explain what happened on the defensive line? Now, they had a lot of guys leave, and I get that. I thought their secondary looked lost. But I, I'm i not going to panic over a spring game at all. But you have two sides of the football, one offensively that looked so much like years better than you did, and you getting pushed around in simplistic stuff that Alabama ran, I, I don't know if they don't need to go into the portal and get one, maybe two interior defensive linemen that can play. And I think that they're going to be a player there. I think the biggest concern for me, though, going back and watching Alabama this morning was specifically how lost at times their DBs were. And that was something that played Kalen DeBoer last year when Washington had a secondary that was in the hundreds all year long until they played Texas and moved into, I think, 98th in the country. And then they played Michigan. Then they moved 95th in the country. So two teams that didn't have success against them throwing the football, specifically Michigan, because that's just this wasn't their game. I do worry that that might be a trend for Kalen DeBoer. And a lot of times, guys, when you look at air raid principal dudes, air raid principal head coaches, that is something that always plagues them. Ask Lincoln Riley if it plagues him. So they're going to have to go back into the portal and grab interior defensive tackles. And quite honestly, they're going to have to go and get a, a corner and a safety because they're not, if they want to go and even remotely live up to their standard, which I don't think that they can, and I think that's an impossible task for Kalen DeBoer to do, you, you're definitely going to have to go back into the portal and get those two things. So all in all, good day for Alabama. Wrap it up with this. What are you doing with your field? Like, how embarrassing. How embarrassing. Especially under a new head coach. If you want to, if you want to, I'll never forget Saban saying this one time at a coach's clinic. He said, sometimes if you want to be the part, if you want to be the man, you got to look like it. You got to act like it. You got to be it. I know that their field had a lot of dead grass on it, and people don't really care about that kind of stuff. All Blake is making a big deal. If you want to be the man and continue to be the man, which you have been under Saban in the last 17 years, you got to look the part. And I know that that's something small, but come on. Come on. All right. Let's go to the University of Georgia. Guys, I, I, every time that I watch the Georgia Bulldogs play, especially during the offseason when you – excuse me, see him in a spring game, I always walk away just floored at how talented they are at each level. And yesterday on the Rafino and Joe show, I said this, and I'm going to repeat it. Guys, I have absolutely no idea where their weaknesses are. I, I, I really don't. If, of all the game, spring games that happened this weekend, the the one that was the most back and forth First-team offense versus first-team defense was the University of Georgia, and it's exactly what you want to see. I think Mikel Williams is an outright freak. And I think if you listen to Kirby enough and listen to what he's trying to tell you, I think that he thinks that Mikel Williams might be the best outside linebacker, best defensive guy, one of the best that he ever has ever had. He is a freak show. I think C.J. Allen is a freak show. But as much – and I'll ask you this. Oh, actually, let me ask you this, and this is to some non-Georgia fans, but even to some of the Georgia fans that might see this clip. When you think of the University of Georgia under Kirby Smart, what's the first thing that you think about? Outside of national titles, and maybe outside of the bowl cut, it's interior defensive linemen. Well, on Saturday, somebody forgot to tell them. Now, what I've heard coming out of Georgia from just people on social media and you've sent it to me or whatever is, well, Blake, we didn't really run a lot of things defensively. Well, need you, neither did you really offensively. 
You ran an inside, you ran an inside post, you ran a couple of fades, you ran a couple of crossing routes with your tight end, and then you ran the football. You did a couple of things out of play action for Carson Beck. And quite honestly, your offensive line dominated. Now, there are a lot of times that you got pressures, and those are things that you want to see. But Carson Beck was able to get the ball out in time for it to not be a sack. Yesterday, what I saw from the University of Georgia, and what we talked to our good buddy Brooks Austin about, was the first question that I asked him when he joined us was, is the University of Georgia, what is their, what is their biggest thing that you're going into the offseason asking about or having questions about? And it was the offensive line. Well, those questions just got answered. Because when you're playing a defense that is as good as Georgia, and your offensive line is able to do what they did on Saturday. Guys, if that was their biggest weakness, I, 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 I would hate to see their biggest strength, which I still do believe that their biggest strength is, is the athleticism that they have defensively. All over the place, they are, <laughs> guys, they are the most athletic team in the country. Maybe outside of Ohio State, I think you can make that argument. But I look at Georgia yesterday. Both first and second team offensive line, highly impressive. That was the first thing I wrote down. Mikel Williams, absolute freak show, batted down a pass, got an interception. Carson Beck was out there dropping dimes like his name was Tom Brady. Because he looked fantastic. Well, Blake, he had two picks. Well, he had two picks against a freak show outside linebacker defensive end that has a 40-plus vertical goes up, taps it up to himself, and he gets a pick. And then C.J. Allen, that might be the best DB, our best uh, best overall defensive player in the Southeastern Conference. But Carson Beck was throwing dimes. He, he hit Dylan Bell a couple times, who I think is the ultimate Army Swiss knife, or Swiss Army knife, I should say, in the SEC. And by the way, they got a kid from Miami named Colby Young. He's a freak. Dominic Lovett is a freak. They finally actually, on the boundary, have weapons. And Trevor Etienne's emergence, it was incredible. Now, I'm going to give you a hot take here. I don't think that Trevor Etienne is the best player that entered the transfer portal this past year. I do, however, think that there is a possibility because of the way that they were running the football on Saturday and the way that they want to run the football at Georgia, he might be the best overall impact to a team. Without question. Because... Him being inserted into that lineup, he look at him. He was an outright freak. Guys, we're going to talk about a lot of teams here. And the University of Georgia, I, do, I don't see a weakness. Maybe secondary, maybe, maybe. But it's tough for me to say secondary when you got a freak show outside linebacker making a play like that and then a linebacker making a play like that and say, well, yeah, their secondary might have some question marks, but they got just outright Adonises running around everywhere. If you're in the SEC or you're a fan of another team in the SEC, good luck to you. Good luck to you. Oh, by the way, I saw a team yesterday at the University of Georgia that's pissed off. Because last year, they got beat by Alabama in the SEC championship game. And a lot of people kind of just wrote Georgia off for whatever reason. Oh, they hadn't been as dominant as they were the last two years. Well, no shit. But that team yesterday, in a spring game, I might add, in a spring game, was pissed off. There is no coach in the country now that Saban is out and now that even Harbaugh is out. The best culture of college football right now is Georgia. And the guy that spent the longest time with Nick Saban was Kirby Smart, their head coach. Guys, I, I don't know if we're not seeing a replication of what we saw the last 17 years with Saban, if we're not seeing it with Kirby. I, I really don't know if we're not. And I, I'm not saying that they're going to win a national championship this year. I think that they... All, could and are going to be my favorite to win a national title. But I look at them and say, I don't know what their weaknesses are. And I think they're the most, I think they're the scariest team in the country. 
Now, Ohio State made a big push. Ole Miss made a big push in the portal. I think Miami is going to be really good. None of them have the overall talent that the University of Georgia does. None of them. So, highly impressed by their offensive line, highly impressed by the competitive nature. And by the way, just throwing this out there, you know, Kirby was in his post game presser yesterday, or two days ago, excuse me. And, you know, most teams around the country don't play their best players. Well, Kirby's got guys that's walking up to him pissed off saying, I want to play, I want to play, I want to play. And other teams around this uh, around this conference, around the country, a lot of kids don't do that. The culture at the University of Georgia leaps and bounds is better than everywhere else. He has established that because that's what his mentor taught him. And now he's establishing it. And, and to be real with you, how Kirby is doing it now in the day of NIL is even more impressive, if we're being honest. Because you just heard Nick Saban a couple about a month ago say, man, this team, this last year's team that I had, 80% of them, all they want to talk about is their, their name, image, and likeness. What am I going to get in NIL? Well, Kirby's got the best culture in the country during NIL. So the GOAT on his way out was, I don't want to say complaining about it, but he was complaining about it. Hats off to Kirby. I, I think that they're going to be the best team. Now, they face some really good opponents this year. Obviously, they got Ole Miss. They have Texas. But, guys, I, I, even Clemson, if I'm not mistaken, in game one. Guys, I think that they're going to win all of those. I, I really do. I think you have a team that probably should have been in the playoff last year. And to be real with you, I, I, even if Georgia would have lost last year in the SEC championship game, I would put them ahead of Florida State. Well, Blake, why would you do that? Because, guys, no matter what would have happened, if everybody against Florida State would have played, even though they played in the bowl game and some guys opted out, Georgia would have still smoked that ass. Still would have smoked them. That team last year should have been a, 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 a playoff team. Should have been a playoff team. All right, let's continue here. Let's go down to the, the – actually, the Georgia Bulldogs' is biggest rivalry. Now, if you're just joining us, we will get to all of your comments. I am just trying to go through all of these spring games uh, quickly enough. That way, we can get your questions at the end. So, if you have questions, thoughts, concerns, you can put them inside the chat. The best way to do that is sending in a super chat, and at the end, I promise you, we will get to all of them uh, when we can. Let's go down – to Gainesville for just a moment. How about it? I really went into yesterday or two days ago thinking that we would see some different things from Billy Napier and the University of Florida. And at some position groups we did, you know, like I, I think the interior of the offensive line, they did not have a bad day. They got some push. They, they, they were fine. I thought that Graham Mertz was very serviceable on Saturday, and I think he will still continue to be serviceable. And you saw what you needed to see, him taking shots down the field, which he did, and he did not look bad. I think Graham Mertz got a bad rap coming into the SEC last year. Guys, if he stays healthy, the kid's going to be very serviceable. He makes all of the right decisions. That's what you're going to get from Graham Mertz. In this offense, he's going to make all of the right decisions. Here is the biggest takeaway for me. It's not that Florida had 10 guys on uh, field goal or field goal block. It's not, you know, some of the things that they did in the secondary, even though I believe that the worst secondary that I watched this weekend was at Florida, even more than LSU, even more than Arkansas. I think the worst secondary that I saw this weekend was at Florida. The biggest thing for me is, is Ross Callaway has been promoted and Billy has changed nothing about what they're doing de offensively. Now, I know what you're going to say. What every Gainesville or every Florida fan in Gainesville will say, well, Blake, it's a spring game. What do you want them to open it up? Yeah, a little. You know, I hate 
this is a pet peeve of mine. You ready? Now, I don't want you to show them everything. I don't want you to, to show teams everything that you would do in spring. But as the great Nick Saban and a lot of coaches have said, the more things that you show on film is the more things that they got to defend for. Oh, and by the way, Florida, you have Miami in week one. It's not like you can hold anything back any damn way. Now, maybe Russ Callaway and maybe that offense has some different wrinkles. And you did see some. But it's the same old, same old in Florida. Like, I, I look at DJ Lagway. Great kid. Going to be a great quarterback. you got talent there. You have offensive talent. I think Trey Wilson is one of the top maybe five, maybe six best receivers in this league. But you're not good enough along the offensive line. I don't know what you're going to do at running back. And I think your play calling at times is questionable. Billy's offense, and I told Florida fans this when he was hired, as a guy that lives in the state of Louisiana, watched a lot of ULL football when he was there. You cannot be sideline to sideline in this league. The jet sweep motion and everything you want to do trying to get sideline to sideline does not work. You got to get north and south in this league. I, I think that their front seven might be even a little bit better. But, man, that secondary is not good what it, at all. And I know that that's been a question mark for them in the first two years of Billy Napier. There's nothing that I saw on film that I like from their secondary. Now, they got a pair of picks, and, and they freaked out over it. Yeah, bad reads. But for the majority of the day, you had dudes running wide-ass open. And you've seen Graham Mertz, you've seen DJ Lagway all spring. You know what they're going to run after you. Uh, guys, I, I, I just got to be real with you. I, I saw nothing that changed my opinion of them, good or bad. I think that their last two years, Florida, without Anthony Richardson for one of them. I don't think they can make it to a bowl game. And I know that that's a lot coming and saying, or a lot saying coming out of spring. I don't think that they're any good. I, I, I don't see it. Like, there, when you, even when you're in spring, and I think that there is a lot of truth to you, you know, there are things that you can take away in spring. There's not one thing that I took away in spring and I did not expect. Like, there wasn't something that I saw. Maybe DJ Lagway would be the exception, but I kind of felt like I would see that from him. Like, he, the post route that he threw for a touchdown, beautiful. Outright beautiful. But there's just not anything on this team that I saw that makes me look at them and say, yeah, man, they might have gotten better there. They had no pass rush. And when they did generate even slightly some pass rush, Graham Mertz was able to run out of it. Because you can't let Graham Mertz outrun you to the edge. Now, I know that Mertz is a good enough athlete to do it, but you can't allow that. I like Austin Armstrong a lot. I know that uh, Ron Roberts is there now, too, the head coach of defense for whatever in the hell that means. But... Just being real with you, I <sighs> I don't know, man. I, I there's nothing. You can't get you, you got an INT on Mertz, but you got carved up. The secondary is not good at all, and you didn't get a pass rush. Your best your best end, your best defensive end is that old miss now. I, I feel bad for Florida fans. But but I will tell you, to, to every Florida fan that will watch this, this clip, help is on the way. Because I don't think Billy survives through the year. I, I, I really don't. I think you got to pull the plug. And at some point, you got to start having the conversation, when do you pull the plug on some administration that keeps making these hires? And fires, by the way. Let me give you let me give you Florida fans just a little uh, let me tell you a tale 
very quickly. Now, our good buddy Gator Dave asked Dan Mullen this question oh so many years ago about recruiting. And Florida fans, basically, they had a bad year. They fired Dan, because, and mainly because they thought he couldn't recruit well enough, and that's fine. I get that. He went 6-6, six and six, I believe, and they fired him. Meanwhile, that was coming off a year where he got to the SEC championship game as a head coach. I think they should have given Dan Mullen another year. That's me personally. I think that they panicked. But do you see this guy behind me? His name is Joe Burrow. Let me tell you a tale. LSU's worst recruiting class under Ed Orgeron was overall the best class because you got guys like Jamar Chase, Terrace Marshall, Joe Burrow. Calavon Chesson, I think, was in that class. Actually, he wasn't in that class. He was the year before. Let me think of some other guys that were in that class. I'd have to go back and look. But bottom line was Ed Orgeron and LSU hit on their evaluations. You panicked. And you fired Billy Napier, or you hired Billy Napier, excuse me. You hired Billy Napier because you thought LSU was going to do it. That's not coming from me. I mean, it's pretty much well known around everywhere in this state that Billy has either talked to, ULL, whoever. You know, ULL got the, the buyout, and basically Florida moved the way that they did because they thought LSU was moving in when LSU didn't even interview Billy Napier. Not, they didn't even get an interview. I feel bad for Florida. Now, I will tell you this. Florida has an opportunity. Florida has a massive, massive opportunity at the end of this year. You got to hit on your head coach. You got to hit on the guy that you that you're going to bring in here. You can't go settle for a Dan Mullen. You can't go settle. Even though I think I thought Dan was a great head coach. To be real with you, I don't think he could ever give you over the top. But I thought he was serviceable enough. You can't go hire G five Sun Belt Billy Napier because you're not improving anywhere. There's nowhere that I look at Florida and say you're improving here, here, and here. Maybe quarterback, maybe, but that's because you got a freak of nature kid in DJ Lagway, who, by the way, if Billy Napier gets fired, are you a thousand percent sure that there's not a team that won't come in there and offer him a shitload of money to get him to their school? You're crazy to believe, ever believe, and should be safe about his commitment, ever. You have an opportunity. One of the coaches you went to go get was in the at the University of Miss or Mississippi State, and I think you need to go back to the to the state of Mississippi. But you're going to have to go north of Stockfield to go get him. I'm going to continue to say it until I'm blue in the face. You don't let Lane Kiffin give you no for an answer, but you're going to have to punt on this year. And I think that deep down, deep, deep, deep down, you know that I'm what I'm telling you is the truth. You can't beat Miami. You can't beat Florida State. You can't beat LSU. Uh, you can't beat Georgia. Right there. Right there alone. That's four losses. I don't think that they can. I think Miami is going to go into Gainesville and win. I, I Even though I think the, the Gainesville is arguably the toughest place to play. One of the toughest places to play. I think they're going to go in there and win. I think Miami is one of the most talented teams in the country. All right. You know, my migraine is starting to fade a little bit. Maybe it's because I'm talking about college football. And when you talk about something you love, you know, it is what it is. You start feeling better about yourself. All right. So we got Tennessee, Arkansas, and LSU left before we start getting your thoughts, questions, concerns. Let me do this. We're about 42 minutes in. Um, let me get to – I'll get to this uh, quick comment. Yeah, that Coach Ken, Tennessee. I don't think that they can beat Tennessee. Right? Like, I, 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 legit, I, <laughs> I legitimately don't think that they can beat Tennessee. Now, here – they can't beat Tennessee because 
Tennessee lost to them in Gainesville last year, and now they got to go to Knoxville, and I, I they're going to get their they're going to get their lick back. They're going to get they're going to get their lick back. So, like I said, I, I I look at the University of Florida and just say, look, they're the only team in the SEC, the only team in the SEC that can go for them. I think that so I do four tiers when I talk about ranking the SEC. Right now, Florida is in Tier 4. They are the only team. You know, really, they're the only team in Tier 3 or 4 that can go from that bottom and go to the tippy-tippy top and run the conference. When Florida is right, guys, it is right. And good luck stopping them. But until then... They're in purgatory. They're in college football purgatory. There's nothing that they can do right now. The only thing that that could save them is if Billy in this transfer portal window goes and gets a ridiculous amount of talented dudes and they just out-physical and out-athlete everybody. I don't think he's going to do that. I think you need two tackles. I think you need a guard. Like, I don't think you're good enough along the offensive line. I don't think you're good enough. If you want to get where you want to go, you're not good enough at running back. So, when you're judging Florida and you're judging Graham Mertz, understand, outside of maybe a guy here or there, they don't have the weaponry. They don't have the dudes. It is the most crazy thing when you see teams like Florida or LSU or Texas or whoever that normally have the dudes that at a specific position and they just don't. And their secondary is horrible. Secondary is absolutely horrendous. So, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if they play Kentucky. Kentucky's another team. I'm sure that I'm sure that they do. H-Town Creole says that KMSL, killing myself laughing, Milro could only throw deep to uncover receivers, his accuracy has not improved that much that fast. H-Town Creole, did you watch the game, yes or no? Because let me let me remind you of people who haven't watched this show or if it's your first time. Name a time that your boy's been wrong on quarterback play. I'll wait. I remember when y'all said the same thing about me and Miles Brennan. I remember this time last year, I told you that I placed a $100 bet on Jane Daniels to win the Heisman. Plus 4,000, I might add. So, I, I'll i make that bet. I'll make any bet with you. I Any bet with you. What y'all do is, and this is what I said earlier about Alabama, specifically, what people do coming here if you're an LSU fan is, oh, it's Alabama, screw them, so we can't say anything positive about them. All right, let me tell you this. If you're an LSU fan, actually, we can talk about LSU before we get to a break. If you think that Alabama, let me tell you, if you think that the University of Alabama can't come into Death Valley and beat you, you're an idiot. You're a down, you're you're a downright idiot. Did you see the way that they ran the football? At this current moment, you do not have the interior defensive line help that can get you there. Now, when tomorrow and the portal happens and you get commits and all that kind of stuff. Okay, then we can reevaluate that situation. But until that day comes, I, I don't know. So LSU had their spring game on Saturday. I've talked about them a lot already. It's a team that we cover more than anybody. So I'm going to leave this limited specifically to tonight when we're on with our good friend Carter Bryant and what we said last night. LSU is three defensive tackles away from being a playoff team. Potentially. I think secondary is still an issue. Now, I had a lot of people debating me what coverage it was. Now, we'll talk to Carter Bryant tonight. You know, Br- Brian Kelly said that, and, and one of the busted coverages, the one to Kyron Lacey that was cover three. Well, someone's going to have to tell the opposite side corners that it was cover three because both safeties and corners are, on an all-22 copy, which we'll talk about tonight, both of them ran cover two. Here's the truth. 
you're going to have to start pulling guys that are experienced and seniors if they're not good enough. I do think that LSU defensively was vanilla to some extent of what they've run and what we've seen them run in spring. But you're not, you weren't that vanilla. You were still sending corner blitzes out of the slot. You couldn't generate a pass rush on this great offensive line. Now, offensively, guys, like we've been saying all spring about them, they're going to continue to do things offensively. They're going to continue to dominate. LSU right now could run the football wherever they wanted to. Now, I think that they've gotten that much better. I'm not saying that they're not going to have tough games along the way. Alabama, you know, Alabama uh, from last year I thought was tough on them. They abandoned – Jim Brock and them abandoned the run, but I understand why they ha- they did, and they had to. And Jane Daniels was your running game. You're not going to be able to get over on them in the running game this year. But, guys, in my opinion, I've, I've been covering this team since 2017. I don't know of a position group that has been this bad since I've started covering them. Since, so we're coming up on what? Seven, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So seven, eight years. Um, or seven, eight seasons. There's not been a, a worse unit than this one. Ever. Not at any position. Now you could say 2020 offensive line, but you still had three guys that played and and two of them are starting and another guy got drafted in Austin Deculus. Like you still had draftable guys that were on your offensive line. You don't have draftable guys on your interior defensive line right now. You just, you simply do not. So if I'm looking at LSU and we'll talk about them a, a lot tonight. You're not ready. And if you feel like you are, if you feel like you're a playoff team, good on you. But right now, you're not a playoff team. You're still busting coverages. And see, here's the thing. I don't care who busted the coverage and has been busting coverages for LSU over last year and who was busting coverages on Saturday. It, I, I, I don't care if it was Ashton Stamps, Sage Ryan, the Rugaroo could have been out there busting coverages. I could give a shit. Here's the problem that LSU has defensively outside of just interior defensive linemen. What are you missing? What are you mi- like what are you missing in reference to you've had two defensive coordinators now, two different defensive back coaches, actually four different defensive back coaches and you're still missing calls. If they actually did miss a call, which on the Kyron Lacey touchdown, I do not believe that they missed a call. I do not believe that they missed a call because I still got other corners and safeties running cover too. It's a, it's more than a blown coverage. It's, I don't know if this team right now in the secondary has the football IQ or experience to do what they need to do. Guys, you, you're missing. It, it's one thing if, Forget who, who you believe broke the uh, had the broken coverage because you're going to believe that I'm biased, which you told me in the comments. I think it was over 50 comments that say, oh, Blake's just biased asshole. Okay, well, here's me being a biased asshole. I don't give a shit who broke the coverages. What I would care about is that it got broken and it's something that was a symbol or something that was a staple for your defense last year. The only thing that's the same is the personnel. That's the only thing that's the same. So if you have the same personnel and you're having the same issues, guys, they did not run anything that is not day one freshman in high school install. Nothing. Nothing. So Stamps, Ryan, whoever it was, I I, I could give a Rudy Pooh. To be real with you, you got to get better there. All right, a couple of comments before we get to the break. Uh, Damien says, Quinn Ewers versus Carson Beck for Heisman. Potentially, potentially. He also says, we're called Louisiana. I'm not – look, I'm sorry, Damien. I'm just not going to call you Louisiana. 
OG Gary says, sup, dudes. Good evening to you, sir. Uh, Brian Reese says, they have Kentucky coming into town for homecoming. How about that? Oh, Danny Girl with back-to-back -back comments says, I watched the Alabama game. I missed your segment on it. I will, will, will rewatch. But I was impressed by Milro, and I thought their O-line looked improved over last year. That is pretty much exactly what we said, Danny, if we're being honest. She also says, yes, Blake, I said the same thing about their run game. It was next level for sure. No doubt. No doubt. I I, I just I, – I look at them and say to myself, like, they still have a lot of talent, right? Like, they still have a lot of talent. All right, I got th two more teams that I need to talk about, Tennessee and Arkansas. Let me get to a very quick break. We'll come back and do that. We'll field some more of your questions. He says, I got to love my alma mater, Decasions, man. I feel you. I feel you, Damien. I feel you. Got more SEC to talk about. We do that next. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way for you to wager on all of your favorite sports, contests, events, with the first-to-market odds in lines. Find reviews for all the news for each league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, college sports, esports, and even golf. BetOnline continues to be the top online resource for all of your sports information for live in-game betting props and futures head on over to bet online today and use your mobile device to join and make your first sports bet use our promo code believe 50 that's believe 50 b-l-e-a-v five zero to receive your 50 percent off welcome bonus on your first deposit that's betonline.ag betonline.ag Louisiana is unique. The food, the festivals, even the bugs. No, not mud bugs. Unwanted bugs like these. The ones you don't want crawling in your home or business. Trust the shield from J&J &J Exterminating. We've been protecting Louisiana homes for over 50 years, earning the trust of our clients because we deliver what we promise. Protect your home from pests. Get the shield from J&J &J Exterminating. J&J Exterminating. Yeah. J&J &J has protected Louisiana homes and businesses for over 60 years. We call them today, make the pets go away. J&J &J exterminating. Yeah. The first person that I think that should uh, hear that sound is Jane Daniels. All right, we got two more that we need to get to. The University of Tennessee. So Tennessee had – or. Oh, God, I want to do it, but I have a migraine, so I think it, it's going to hurt, but I got to do it. Rock, no, I can't do it because they just beat LSU. They swept LSU in baseball. I'm not singing no damn Rocky Top. So Rocky Top, the Tennessee Volunteers had their spring game this weekend. Guys, they're really, Nico is going to be really good. Like I 1,000% believe that Nico is going to be one of the better quarterbacks in the Southeastern Conference next year. He did miss some things. I think he missed some throws. I think he misread some things, but all in all, he had a really fine day. I got two concerns if right now if I'm the University of Tennessee. You know that Nico and Josh Heupel and this team, along with the wide receivers, they can put up a crap load of points. And truthfully, they probably will put up a crap load of points. The issue that I would I have with Tennessee after what I've seen and heard and looked from this spring is two main areas. I don't know how good they're going to be along the offensive line. Now, you go and get Lance Hurd from LSU. Can he you know, come in here, be a day one starter, do much better than what you probably had a year ago? I think that Lance can go up there and be pretty damn good. But I don't know where your running game is going to come from. You know, if you go back and watch, there's not a lot of great things that I liked in the running game. Now, I do think that they're going to Tennessee is going to go in the portal and get a back. And if they do, maybe I'll feel a little bit better about what they're going to do in the running game. And it's not necessarily Hypel's bread and butter, but even though last year it was their bread and butter, they, I mean, completely different stylistically on how they did things because of Joe Milton. But I think now that you have Nico. You're going to be throwing the ball all over the place, and it's going to look more like when you had Hendon Hooker than anything. So good on them. I do worry about their offensive line and their back. Man, I, I think that this is becoming a theme here. Their secondary is also not good. Their secondary 
even though that there weren't a lot of massive plays that were hit on them, the problem that I had with Tennessee on Saturday was there was a lot of guys that got missed that were wide open. And I think that if you talk to anybody at Tennessee, they will tell you if they're being real with themselves, uh, it's going to be the same type of Josh Heupel stuff. Uh, going to be a good front seven. I think their defensive line, it's better than people give them credit for because you have a coach like Josh Heupel that's there. I think they have one of the top three best defensive lines in the SEC. But when I look at them and say that, their secondary, th their front seven is going to have to get to the quarterback to save their secondary. Busted coverage after busted coverage after busted coverage. And if they would have had better passes from some of these quarterbacks, it would have been an outright beating. They can tell you there it wouldn't have been, but there were I, I counted five times on Saturday that wide open receivers were missed that probably either would have gotten massive games or would have scored. So that is a big concern. All right, let me move to Arkansas very quickly. I know I didn't spend on Tennessee long, but need to get to the University of Arkansas. I know that Arkansas fans are very hyped up about John Calipari. Well, Blake, this is a football, spring football breakdown. I think your excitement about Cal being on this, uh, on uh, being the head coach or head, uh, our head basketball coach has trickled over to your feelings on what you saw on Saturday. You ain't that good. You're not that good. You, you got individual talent. I think you can be better defensively. I think that you have a quarterback that can run. Your offensive line is – you You know, I look at Arkansas fans and say, y'all blame Cody Kennedy. <laughs> well, who are you going to blame now? You're not good enough. Now, if you get to six, seven, eight wins, it's because schematically you just outcoached everybody. You don't have the bodies that everybody else does. When you look at the games that we saw on Saturday from every single team, the, the team that if it were me that I said, all right, well, uh, maybe Florida and Arkansas are very similar in a lot of ways. Very similar. They think that they have the weapons on the outside. Yeah, maybe to your standard, but not to the standard that you get to six, seven wins. I don't I don't know that. Now I think Bobby Bobby P can come in there and call some really good offenses, but man, you know, like they they were, you know, losing their minds over a quarterback doing a zone read and they would have gotten tackled and they let him go in and score. That ain't that ain't gonna happen in a game. Guys aren't gonna two hand touch your quarterback, bro. I think Landon Jackson's good. I, I desperately think that they need linebackers. Uh, I think they might need a safety in a corner. If they if they want to get to seven eight wins, they need linebacker, safety, corner, and offensive line. I think they could be serviceable at running back. I think they could be serviceable at quarterback at times. But the pieces around everything is just not to the level that Sam Pittman needs, arguably and maybe to save his job. So we'll see. A lot of good spring games. A lot of good teams. A lot of good players. So, yeah. All right, let me get to a couple comments before we get out of here. Uh, Brandon Reese says, Blake, I know Ole Miss fans don't want to hear it, but let's be honest. Kiffin would leave Ole Miss for Florida in a heartbeat. I do think that he would. Kiffin versus Kirby – Every year would be fun to watch. I think that he would. And, and look, I, to be real with you, I thought what Ole Miss did this weekend was a joke. The the hot dog eating contest and the slam dunk contest. All right. Now we're just making a mockery out of things. Hey, Lane, what aren't you wanting to show me? Maybe he just is done with it all, doesn't want to get any of his guys hurt. But, I mean, slam dunk contest, you could definitely do that. So, yeah. Uh, Damien says, speaking of QBs in the draft, Caleb Williams will be a Jamarcus Russell-level bust, and Daniels will be a franchise guy for New England. Cool. I don't, I don't know if Jaden wants to go to New England. 
You know what I keep hearing? And I'm being honest. God, I got massive migraine. You know what I keep hearing? I keep hearing that the Giants want to move up for Jaden. That's what I keep hearing. Even with Danny Dimes. Oh, freaking migraines, man. Uh, Black Mamba says, Blake, who do you think are the two best SEC teams so far? And who do you think has the potential to be the two top SEC teams going into the season into week one based on talent, health, and scheme? Uh, I think Georgia, it's not remotely close. Um, I don't know about Texas. I, I would need to go and look at them. I do think that there is a level of things being open. Who it will be that second team? I don't. I, I'm not. Can, I'm not completely sold. I think that Texas can go ten and two. I think that. I, I don't think that. I don't know if they can go eleven and one. But I want to see what happens because look, last year Quinn Ewers went down and they got to squeak one out against Kansas State. They got to squeak one out against Houston. You ain't squeaking one out here every week in the SEC. It's just not going to happen. You're going to get beat. Um, I don't know. But I will tell you this. Georgia separated the pack from everybody. They are separated from the pack. So, yeah. Um, uh, Damien says still butthurt about him transferring away from the Cajuns, but I get it. If you're talking about Kyron Lacey, yet Kyron's a dude. Uh, Danny girl says, are we seeing a lack of high school development on the defensive side of the ball? I think they just missed Danny. If I'm being honest, is this causing so many teams to have personnel struggles defensively? I just think the, the teams that are struggling, they miss and the teams that didn't or teams that aren't missing. They just clearly didn't. Well, Michigan, Ohio State, Georgia, Texas. I mean, those teams didn't miss. Those teams didn't miss. H-Town Creole says this defense will be just fine if they got some good defensive tackles out of the portal. You know what the biggest thing about that comment, uh, H-Town Creole, if... See, what you want me to do here is, and I don't have the ability of doing this. Now, you as a fan have the ability to do this because I don't. I won't take a comment like H-Town Creoles, and if you're wrong, come back and say, nah, nah, and a boo-boo, and I won't point you out specifically. But what y'all do is y'all come in here and y'all point me out specifically. If I got to talk about the teams as I see them right now, guys, the portal's not even open yet. H-Town Creole, you have no idea who they're going to get in the portal, and you have no idea if they're going to hit on. There's a reason guys hit the portal. And you whiffed last year. I mean, Denver Harris was a five-star. So, they did not have a team full of six-year players. Stop the cap. No, they did not. They had two. And by the way, you got one. On your team. All right. Brandon Reese says, Blake, uh, our, our one mock draft has Jane to the commanders. Yeah. Uh, Blake, what do you think of Nico? Will he be a Heisman guy? Thoughts? I don't know if he can make a Heisman. He could. He's got the talent, too. He's got the arm. He's got the legs. He can play. He missed some bad – he had some bad misses on Saturday, though. Really bad. But when he, when he found his rhythm, he was on. Really, really, really on. All right. See y'all tonight. Y'all have a good one. Peace.